Again, just a big round of appreciation to the Lord for our celebration team. We're doing such a wonderful job. Go ahead, give them a big round of appreciation. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're seeing new faces, young faces, uh, here, up here on the stage. Praise God. Um, conscientious, cautious, visionary, uh, ministers of God. There's a commonality in them that, that is very observable. Um, people who believe that God has a, a big vision for them in the future, a great thing, not just task, but work for them and uh, effectiveness and productivity and um, a manner that God is going to use them in a big way. Somehow, one thing that they do, what, one thing that you would notice, many of them, probably not all of them, is in the early stages of their lives, I remember um, Billy Graham in their ministry life, is to find people around them who would look after them who they could confide to, who they could be accountable for, who could pray with them, counsel them. And, and uh, it's a blessing for ministers to have people like that surrounding you. you know, Billy Graham at the very start of his ministry, knowing that God has something great going for him and how he sees the hand of God moving in his life, he right away prayed and called several people, about four people if I remember it correctly, and committed into accountability that most of those people were the original four, I think, after decades of ministry, are still there with him. And they've gone through the years, but these people are the ones who prayed with him, um, counseled him, confided in him, watched over him, and so on and so forth. And it's such a blessing for a minister to have that. Because the life of a minister is sometimes different. Probably not sometimes. But oftentimes. Different from those who are not in the ecclesiastical office. And it's very difficult for them a lot of times to just find anybody that they could talk to and release. So many of us could easily like blurt out our heart feelings or misgivings perhaps to anyone as for counsel or advice, ministers ought to be very careful in taking that round of opening themselves up. So it's a, somehow a sigh of relief knowing that there is somebody who would listen to you, who would understand your weaknesses, who you would not have to tiptoe with, who you don't have to be careful about the words you're going to speak, but you can just release yourself to them and somehow find rest in the Lord through their presence and their wise counsel and somehow start afresh and somehow understand you without condemning you. People who have walked the same route as you have identify with the same feelings that you have felt. Know the pain that you undergo. And I think I appreciate God's giftings more because there are ministers who are able to do that, that they become a blessing to an individual. But if we see, I said I praise God for the giftings of God more because there are those ministers who not only become a blessing to an individual, but God has gifted them in such a way that they truly become a blessing to a greater body of the church. And today the reason I'm saying this is because there is such a man in our midst who has gifted by God, I believe, has been favored by God, has been a favor of God in my life, that in this church, and of all the people I know, of all the pastors I'm surrounded with, or I get in touch with a lot of time, constantly, there's one man and only one man that I'm actually able to talk to, to whom I'm able to pour out whatever is going on in my life feeling comfortable that he will not betray me, that he will be kept between us. But as I said, if there's anyone here in this church, probably who knows more than anyone about my weaknesses aside from God and the devil, it's my brother. It has been a blessing to my life 
And I praise God because this blessedness in me and the gifting of God is in, in him is not just for me, but God has used him in my way every time he has spoken to our body. And he has become such a blessing to many of us that people would talk to me about how God spoke to them through this vessel. So I am humble to be honored at the same time to introduce my eldest brother. And not probably not, we were, we were actually talking to each other yesterday and the way we talk to each other, knowing our dad, we laugh at it, we laugh at it very much. Because how many of us, we have, how many brothers do we have and sisters do we have? And we always count, we always start counting by saying, those we know. How many brothers do we have and sisters? The ones we know are these. You know, so, well honestly, Kuya, you're not the eldest, right? Based on what we know, okay? But we lived together in a house where he was the eldest in our family, so, Many of you know him, he's a friend to FCF, he's a friend to many of you. So let's again, again, he's a friend, a dear brother and a confidant and a, such a blessing in my life. So let's give him a big, warm FCF welcome, my dear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. As I always say, I come from this. I come from the fiftieth state. That's why I say aloha. Aloha. And I represent not only the fiftieth state, but also King Kamehameha. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know. Um, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that. Uh, our father passed away knowing and accepting the Lord. And he is with Jesus at this very moment. All right. Thank you, Brother June, for reading uh, our text today. I'm sorry if I, I, I told him, I'm sorry, probably I said the wrong chapter. But uh, he was so kind enough to. Uh, to understand my, my, my mistakes. And that's why, as what Brother uh, Pastor Ian said, as ministers, we needed someone to be accountable with. We really need that. And uh, it will be a blessing if the congregation, if you people will be praying for us. Because it's really a very difficult, a very challenging task, which is always ahead of us. In fact, I just came from uh, our annual pastor summit and I tell you it was a different kind of for the several years that I was attending our pastoral summit here this was a different meeting because it was just our leadership allowing us just to be you know not just to be doing anything but just opening our hearts before God telling him our needs telling him our weaknesses telling him Lord are you still calling me or am I still being called? But anyway, uh, that's not what I'm going to share today, but despite the difficulty of time, despite the, this, this fight, despite the challenging situations that we see happening day in, day out in this passing world, my question to you, my brothers and sisters, is that can we still talk about prosperity? Can we still talk about a beautiful life in the Lord? When the dollar is continuing to plunge down, and I don't know if it, if it will still be a mighty dollar. But you know what? This morning, this is not a new thing. It happened thousands of years before. When a person by the name of Daniel was in a hostile, was in an uncomfortable situation, but because he believed in a God who cannot be bound by space and time, who is not affected by the economic <coughs> breakdown, who is not affected by, you know, subjection or... or who is not affected by things that will 
put a person down, the Lord prospered him. The Lord made a distinguishing excellence in this person. So I know Brother June have read this, but if you may allow me to read once again our main text, which is found in Daniel chapter 6. And I want you to open your Bibles there, verses 1 to 4, and then we'll jump to verse 28. All right? It says here, Darius, by the way, Darius is the emperor, the king of Persia, no? decided to appoint 100, 120 satraps. You know what position satraps, you know what, what's that position? Are you aware of that? what satraps are. In ancient Persia, which is actually now the current day Iran, no? satraps are the governors of a province or a political henchman. So in our case, for instance, if we look at the United States, we have Governor Brown of California. We have Governor Abercrombie of Hawaii. And these are, all, these are also subordinate officials, especially a self-important one, okay? So Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, stationed throughout the realm, and over them three administrators, including Daniel. These satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. Daniel distinguished made renowned, made prominent of himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit. So the king planned to set him over the whole realm. The administrators and satraps therefore kept trying to find a charge against Daniels regarding the kingdom. But they could find no charge or corruption for he was trustworthy, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. And in verse 28, if we jump to verse 28, it says there, so Daniel prospered. If you use other words like, so Daniel flourished. Daniel succeeded during the reign of not only one emperor, but two emperors. Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Can we go? Can we please just bow down our heads and let's have a word of prayer? Dear God in heaven, this is your living word. And we know, oh God, the power of your living word that can change our lives in such an awesome, such a wonderful way. Lord, I am just a jar of clay. I am just, Lord, a conduit. I'm just a vessel. And allow me to speak, O oh Lord, your confidence. Allow me to speak, O oh Lord, your truth. And speak to us, Lord, in a clear voice this morning. And as we hear your word, O oh Lord, we know that you will bless us, that you will change us into the kind of people that you wanted us to be, to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Inaantok pa yata ako. Gising, gising. You know, if you hear the word successful, prosperous, accomplished, what, do you, what are you thinking? What do you have in mind when you hear these words? Huh? These are great words and we would like to see those words to be used about ourselves, right? Successful dancer, successful worship leader, prosperous people of the valley, huh? accomplished doctors, accomplished lawyers. So we'd like to hear those words to be tied up with who we are. At the beginning of chapter 6, my dear brothers and sisters, the book of Daniel, the prophet of God, is described as a what? 
a distinguished person. And at the end of the chapter, that distinguished gentleman, the distinguished person by the, na by the name of Daniel is also described as prosperous. He was declared prosperous and successful not from a worldly standpoint, but he was successful and prosperous. He was distinguished from a perspective of the divine, a divine standpoint. And my dear friends, it would be wise for us as a people of God, it would be sensible for us and prudent for us to learn some key principles which contributed to the life of this remarkable man. My question to you this morning is, who wants to be prosperous? Raise your hand. For those who did not raise your hand, I'm sorry. You don't want to be prosperous, it's your problem. <laughs> right? But all of us, it would be so unwise to say, I don't want to be prosperous. But let me tell you, my dear friends, that usually when we use the word prosperity, automatically we tie it up with financial prosperity. But you know what? When you talk about divine prosperity, you do not only talk about financial prosperity. That's the least thing that can happen. It can happen. But he gives you what? He gives you prosperity in health, prosperity in wisdom, prosperity in understanding. It's a holistic approach. So God's kind of prosperity. So let me not belabor on the introduction, but let me go right away to the principles that I want to tell you. And I, I want you to remember that this man, and. I, I just want you to remember that this man was in a situation that was uncomfortable. It was, he was in a place that he doesn't like to be there. He was forced to be there. True or false? Who knows the story of Daniel? You know that he, they were Jews, but they were taken away. They were brought to exile. So, I don't want you to read the entire, or the, the, from chapter 1 to 6, but maybe write it down, and later on when you have your, your, when you have your uh, meditation or your prayer, just study what chapters 1 and 6 is for the book of Daniel. But this chapter speak about the principle of discerning or understanding the will of God. So, in other words, what, I'm, what, what am I saying? If you want to be prosperous, we must be able to understand clearly the perfect will of God. And this is the first life principle that we have to learn. Because despite living in a situation under suppression of an alien power, I want you to remember that Daniel started with Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire, and all throughout the two emperors of Persia. He recognized that he lived in Babylon neither by chance nor coincidence, but by the perfect will of God. He deeply believed that God in his mighty power and perfect plan had orchestrated the circumstances of his life, causing all things to work together for his good. Do you remember what the message of Romans 8.28 says? All things work together for God. Together for good to them who love him and are called according to his purpose. So Daniel's ministry in the Babylonian court glowed, it shined with conviction of being where God wanted him to be. And this was the secret to his being steadfast. Secret ingredient for him being stable. He had to stay where God intended him to be. And I want you to listen carefully. 
He had to stay where God intended him to be, even if it meant he had to be under suppression, without a country, without a home. And everything he was born to be with, and even taking away his name. What was the name that was given to him when he was under the Babylonian court? Is that Belteshazzar? So even his name was taken away from him. So maybe if I am Pastor Sunny or I'm Sunny uh, during that time and I love my name, the king could have given me the name Perfecto. <laughs> You know about the name I remember, just, just to add some spice. I had a, we had a nephew, actually you, uh, my wife's sister Marley had a nephew by the name of, we, you know, every time you call him Louis, wow, you could really see the smile on his face, grinning from ear to ear. But when you ask him, what, what's your real name? What's your full name? I'd rather not tell you. I said, why? They combine the name of my dad and my mom, and that's why my name is Lourdes Nino. Lourdes and Antonio. But Uncle Sonny, I detest it! That's why I just call him Louis. Okay, Louis. AKA Lourdes Nino. But just imagine. Everything was taken away from this man. Now you may ask me, Pastor Sonny, if I am in a suffering or distressed situation, can you still say with confidence that I am in the perfect will of God? It's so easy to say, but Pastor, I'm asking you right now. If I am in suffering, if I'm facing a terminally ill disease, can you still say that I am still in the perfect world? And my answer to you is, if the Lord allowed you to be in that situation, then it is. Amen. However, it doesn't stop there. Because he is still in control of every situation. I don't know if you've heard the latest testimony of my life. Last year, in August, because I'm already beyond my golden years. In fact, I celebrated my 56th birthday last July. So in four more years, I'll be glowing 60. <laughs> Brother Juno. <laughs> All right. And so, when you reach that age, it is a must for you to go to, to, to have a, you know, some checkup like, you know, uh, you know test of, uh, you know, testing on your prostate as a male, and colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is they put something behind you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, because the gastroenterologists look at a lot of stuff, checking your dinuguan uh, uh, inside. Okay? And so I came out, and after a week, I called, I, I received the call, and it says there, it's okay, everything's fine. So it feels good, no? When everything is negative. Everything, and they say you're healthy. December came. And I was sleeping, and Sister Marlin woke me up and said, Pa, huh? and I see there's something urgent, in, that there's some sense of urgency in her eyes, because I said, how come you look so worried? That our primary doctor called up, and he said that your specimen was given a quality test. Like, you know, after testing you, or after getting all this, uh, pathologists would look into what they have looked in 
to before, no? and they will make quality tests. And once you fall into this quality test, what they will do is really study again the specimen, subject it in a very careful analysis to really find out if the result that they had made previously was right. And I said, then what happened? And the doctor said that there's a new finding. And I said, what was the finding? The doctor said, you have a malignant lymphoma. When I talk about lymphoma, in some Tagalog, sabi mga kulani. Lymphoma here. Lymph nodes here, lymph nodes here, lymph nodes here. So, and for such a long time, my dear brothers, I have worked as a corporate guy for a pharmaceutical, for pharmaceutical companies specifically handling oncology products. I have met so many cancer patients who are suffering. And I said, wow! At first, I was in denial. I said, really? I mean, it may, it may not be true. I said, no, you better call up Dr. Guillermo because the instruction is for you to see the medical oncologist right away. And when you talk about the medical oncologist, he's the cancer guy, he's the cancer doctor. And I tell you, when I heard that, it's just like my world is crumbling. It just crumbled. And there were moments every day as I wait to see the oncologist. I would not stop watching TVN. I would not allow my children to, to turn it off. I would sleep and borrow my daughter's iPad just to hear old Christian music. Because every time I don't hear anything, and I would think about the specter of death. I'm really old now, I'm an old man, but I would cry for the fear that I would lose my life. But I said, okay. But you know what? What my wife did is, because I, I belong to a congregation that we, we also have our global congregation. And so what he did was send the email to all our churches, to all our friends. And I know that all our friends, my co-pastors, even my brothers, were praying for me. And so the day came when I had to see the oncologist coming from the Mayo Clinic in Hawaii. Uh, but he's practicing in Hawaii. Good-looking Indian-American guy. Kamal Kumel. And he said, Pastor, we just have to determine what stage your cancer is. Because each stage would require different medication. And I told him that, you know, Dr. Rumel, or Dr. Rumel, I said, I used to handle this. Oh, therefore, I don't need to explain to you all the intricacies of treatment. And I said, yes. I just want you to prepare. But you have to undergo several tests before we can determine the stage and whatever medication we can give you. But definitely, you'll be given a combination treatment, perhaps of radiation and chemotherapy. So I went to PET scan, CD scan, endoscopy, a lot of blood works. I would sit in the cancer center and beside me are all cancer patients. And I tell you, it is so disheartening, so discouraging when you see people, they cannot even smile because they know that one day they will just pass away. And I would tell myself, Pastor Sami, you believe in Jesus, right? But even if I tell him that, and I would see the faces of the other patients. I would feel so bad. Sorry, I didn't eh. But you know what? After the so many tests, I think it's a one month of testing. And I had a schedule of getting back to him, ready to face whatever decision of treatment that I would face. I went to his office and he said, Pastor Sunny, I cannot understand 
the result of all your tests. The pathologist here says, you have a lymphoma, and I do not doubt the findings because you were given a quality test. Quality test. It was studied so intricately that there is no mistake you have this dilemma. But he said, based on your latest test, I couldn't find anything there. Amen. I was controlling my emotion. And I said to him, Dr. Uno, do you believe in miracles? And he said, Pastor, I do now. By saying that, I knew that he was not. Maybe he was a normal Christian, maybe he's not a Christian after all. But when he said, I do now. And when I went out of the, when I went out of the clinic, I went straight to the bathroom of the hospital. I knelt there. It's a good thing no one was there. <laughs> but I tell you, I could not contain myself. I cried before God. And I said, Lord, you are still God, even if I have cancer. You are still God, even if you tell me I have to die now. You are still God, even if I'm in the midst of so much suffering and doubt and failure and weakness and everything. And my dear friends, <laughs> and my dear friends, He will remain God whether you are in a comfortable, in a comfortable in a pleasant situation, he will still remain that even if he wanted. Mm -hmm. Was he in control when Job was extremely suffering? Yes, he was. Was he in control when his disciples later in their respective ministries were executed for his cause? Yes, he was. And God will never forget them because they remain to stay faithful where God brought them. And no matter how the world's standards or measures of accomplishments are in the eyes of the Lord, these people who were seemingly failure in the eyes of people in the world, as far as the Lord is concerned, they were successful, they were accomplished, and they have done a good job. Are we doing a good job for them? Despite the misery, despite the suffering, despite the challenging situations we are facing in. We are facing, rather. We should be because we are God who never change. We have to discern, we have to understand clearly our understanding of Him. So the question is, did God call you to be where you are now? Did God call you to be where you are now? Every Christian, I believe, has the obligation. Every believer has the responsibility and commitment of finding, following, and accomplishing the will of God. Resting and trusting in His sovereignty, in His supreme leadership and rulership. So let me tell you, in and out of season, God remains the same. So, even if I don't have money in my pocket, is that the perfect will of God for me? If He wants it, I will not complain. Because my God will know my need. Clear understanding, clear discernment of the will of God if you want to be prosperous. The next one. This position in the work of God. How do I, how long should I preach? Huh? I know I have a flight, but uh, so this position in the work of God. Daniel's, Daniel 6 verse 3 says, 
Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an excellent, an exceptional spirit. And what the spirit stands for here, it means attitude, it means temperament, it means character and outlook. And because of that, what was the plan of the king? The plan of the king was to put him over the whole realm. He was not even an, he was not even a Persian. He was not even a what? He was not even an Iranian, if we may say. But why is this Persian king putting a person, not even their kind, in such an important position? So Daniel's attitude and outlook in the Word of God magnified his ministry for, for a prolonged period in Babylon. He had a personality and character so focused on the God he believed was working and leading his life even in such an unwanted situation that it did not stop him. It did not deter him to be aspiring for excellence in everything he is doing. Unlike many, perhaps, many of us we're in if we are placed in a position that we don't like what do we normally how do we normally address that if we are placed in a position that we don't like instead of performing well for the sake of the lord we will just go through the motion of doing it and thus ending it with a lackluster monotonous boring performance I remember John Bevere in his book, Undercover. He said, a democratic mindset cannot work or can be effective in kingdom living. Because see, in democratic mindset, oh, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. In other words, what am I saying? If our attitude and an outlook in everything we do is not being done for God's glory and purpose. We will have the tendency of not performing well. Because our main preoccupation, if we don't like it, is what? We whine, we complain, we fret, and will not do anything except. The tendency or nature of people who are like that will just be living for themselves. And it is an I, me, my first scenario. That is why even in a hostile situation, Daniel was preferred by the king above other court leaders. Why? Because of his excellent attitude. It may not have been mentioned in the Bible, but imagine, they were forced to do. He was forced to do what he was doing. But Daniel possessed divine genius and wisdom. He simply outshone all others. The spirit that characterized Daniel was a genial, tender, sympathetic, seeing something good in the worst of a person. And an excellent spirit raises him to supremacy. Therefore we should do and say things with excellence, knowing, my dear brothers and sisters, that we represent not just any king or ruler, but we're serving and representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So if you're a Christian, don't look like a loser. <laughs> huh? Even if you don't have money, don't look like you really don't have money. Huh? Be confident. Because we're serving a king who is not a loser in the first place. He is a winner. And Daniel knows that even if I am in this scenario, I know, I know that this God will work for me. So I have to be excellent in what I do. Can you say amen to that? Amen. 
All right. The third point. <laughs> the third point. We have to be discreet in our walk with God. What do I mean by the word discreet? We have to be modest. We have to be tactful, careful, circumspect, if I may say. Because in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, what were the other envious administrators and governors were doing? Because he was doing an excellent job, and they cannot find any wrong things in what he's doing. They were trying to trap him. You know, the preoccupation of the other governors and the other administrators were to what? To make schemes so that he will fail. So that Daniel will fail. Have you been in that kind of situation when you're doing excellent and what the other people are doing just to put you down, find ways to trap you for you to make a mistake? Another pillar in Daniel's life was the discreetness in his walk with God. Let me tell you, my dear friends, that the position of Daniel was prime minister. After the king, he was the most powerful person in the entire empire. But even with that position of power and authority, he lives with modesty and prudence. And you have to remember that he was appointed in that powerful position. But even in that position, he was careful, he was tactful and sensitive to the feelings and positions of others. And let me say this, he was never arrogant. He was never boastful with his position and power. His feet were still on the ground. And taking this example from this man, I would say that those who would have the opportunity of living a prosperous life must walk so as to be above reproach. You have to know that Daniel's purpose and policy were tested at every point. Yet no character blemish could be found because he was found faithful. So how can we be different? Even if we are living in such prosperity, we must be careful, we must be discreet in our work with that. Another example of a modest man was King David himself. Are you aware that he already knew he was ordained to be king? Do you know that story? He was already ordained to be king to replace King Saul. But he did not come like a swagger speaking and self-proclaiming king. He waited on the Lord's schedule for his leadership to be raised. And instead of having a rebellious spirit, knowing that he is already the anointed ruler, the anointed king, because he could have said to King Saul, Hey, you, King Saul, get out of there. It's mine already. He could have said that. But despite being placed in a risky or dangerous situation, because you know, when, when King Saul learned that he was already the anointed king, what did King Saul do? Made David's life miserable, isn't it? Are you aware of that story? King Saul made David's life so miserable. But what was the, what was the attitude of King David? He did not charge Saul of any wrongdoing. He showed excellent discreetness and humility until his star shone. Not because of his doing, but because of the move of God he serves. I think this is the problem of some people. Because they don't know the word discretion, they would give a title to themselves, even if they don't deserve it. And even if they're not entitled to it. In other words, if somebody addresses you, pastor, and you're not a pastor, have the humility and discretion of correcting that person. 
If somebody addresses you, Mr. President, and you're a janitor, <laughs> tell that guy, hey, I'm the chief janitor, I'm not the president. All right? Be discreet. And just like Daniel, my dear friends, he was discreet, careful, and humble in his walk with God. And you know what? God promoted and prospered. Another principle, number four. Disciplined in our worship of God. Why is this an important principle? Being disciplined in our worship of God. In verse 10 of Daniel 6, there was a situation in his life that because of the scheme, you know, the dirty trap that his adversaries were doing, the king could not anymore recall the law that he made, no? Or that, that the law that he signed, that whoever uh, prays, no? In this particular period of time to his God, will be placed in the lion's den. You know that story, right? It says here, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house, the window in its upper room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day, he got down on his knees, prayed and gave thanks to his God as he had done before. What can we see here? The discipline of this man. Daniel faithfully practiced and possessed an earnest, meaningful, and very personal prayer time with God. Daniel was much disciplined in his worship of God and learning that his enemies were plotting his death and destruction. What did he do? He went home, knelt and prayed three times a day. And his response to the king's decrees and his enemy's evil scheme was what? Prayer. I want you to look at this situation. Imagine people under him would drop him to ruin and destroy his life. Right? And as a prime minister trusted by the king, he could have done something else, Diva. He could have he could have given this 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 guys some problem or some headaches because he was being trapped. He could have said, "Wow, maybe these people, the, 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 these people had to have had to receive their own dose of their medicine." So what I will do? Huh? This is a story. This is just a situation that I'm, that I'm creating because perhaps he could have done this. Oh, they're trying to trap me. Oh, they're trying to destroy me. What I will do is, since I'm trusted by the king, I will probably say, okay, king, I will not follow. I, I will follow your, your, your decree. I will follow your law. But my dear king, I want these people who try to ruin my life be executed. He could have done that. He could have been vindicted, right? He could have said, oh, king, please, execute all of them. Because they're trying to ruin me, your prime minister. Was it possible that he could have done that? Huh? Because if we are being in, in, in our life situation, if some people are trying to destroy us, what is the natural thing that we do? We fight back. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. An arm for an arm. Pag sinipa ka, sibahin mo din. Kaya alam, naka-Nike ka. Di ba? Pag minuto ka ng tinapay, baklohin mo lang isang tinapay. Nasa garap mo nga lang. Right? Can you please uh, uh, interpret that? If you were, if, you, if, if somebody throws a bread at you, throw it, and you also throw bread to him or to that person. But make sure he feels it. Put it in a jar so that he can feel it. He can feel it. So, but, the, but what did Daniel do? Instead of trusting what he can do, he 
He went to his God, and he stood. It was not mentioned how, what he prayed for. Of course, the Bible will not tell us everything. But in that situation, I think Daniel was praying, Lord, give me grace. Lord, make me trust you 100%. And no matter what happens, I will, still, I will still trust you and I will still rely upon you more than the decree of the king. So what happened? Did the king... What did the king do? We know in the story that the king even promoted him. Because the last point that I'm going to tell you is an important point for all of us. Another discipline or another principle that we have to understand is aside from being disciplined, aside from having a good disposition, aside from discerning or discernment or understanding, we must have total dependency on the Word of God. Daniel 6.24 says, The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and endured, for he trusted Amen. Reliance on the word of God contributed to Daniel's prosperity in his entire life, even in an alien land. Facing the life-threatening challenge in his life, Daniel chose to obey and totally depended on God's word. Instead that of King Darius. And he was not being disrespectful, my dear brothers and sisters. But his loyalty and allegiance is solely dependent on the one true and living God. Where even Darius is a mere creation and a subject. So I just want you to imagine you're in a, in a lion's and hungry lions. But you know, Daniel came out. He did not even have a smell of a lion. But imagine, maybe the word said when Daniel was already inside, and definitely these lions were hungry. But the Lord said, probably the Lord said, shut up to the lions. I don't want you to eat, my faithful man. So, I'll be the one to feed you. It could have happened that way. But reality is, when Daniel was in the lines and because he was so dependent on the word of God, nothing happened to him. He came out and the king was overjoyed that he was alive. The word of God is always our authority and anchor in all life circumstances and reliance on it results in what? Reliance on the Word of God results in prosperity. I would like to close by saying, we may not admit it, but this troubled generation secretly wonders whether the God we preach is able to deliver us. It sounds fine in a Sunday sermon. Right? But will it work in a lion's den? When trouble comes, when sickness lays us down, when we bury our dearest in lonely graves, when fondest dreams have faded, when enemies rise up like killer floods, when evil days come and the years draw near, when we say we have no pleasure on them, can we still stay? Or rather, can we still say, our God is able to reach us out from the lion's den? I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, that if we incorporate these principles in our lives, 
we will bring abundance and abounding blessings. Character does not hinder one's career. Daniel had served in Babylon, including Persia, in about, for about 80 years at this point. But he had much bigger influence on Babylon or Persia combined than what it did on him. So my dear friends, my brothers and sisters, when we walk faithfully with the Lord, the world will take notice. And even the world will be on our side. And even the world will promote us because God will make it sure that even in the midst of discomforting and inspiring situation, Our God is much bigger than that. Our God is much, much bigger than that. And therefore, we can say, I will be prosperous because God will make me much. Not only in my needs, but in everything that I will ever have. I will be prosperous because I have a prosperous. I have a winning God. I have a God who will bless me in my life. Do we believe in this God? Do we want to be prosperous? Let's walk with this God. So may I ask, may I ask everybody to please rise. I want to call Pastor because we know I, we have to admit the fact that all of us are facing so much trials and difficulties right now. But rather than salt, rather than say, what a world we live in. No. We'd rather say, I have a winning life. I have a successful life. I have a prosperous life. Who will walk, who will make my way a prosperous life. Amen. We bow down our heads and I would like to ask Pastor Ian to please lead us in a closing prayer. Amen. Just uh, to challenge all of us, the story of Daniel and what he experienced there, one thing that we notice is that first, Daniel knew God personally. Daniel had a personal relationship with God. And the challenge I'd like to place before you today, for that story of Daniel to be somehow applicable to your life as well. Not so much in putting you in the lion's den, but similar situations when you're in trial, or under trial, extreme difficulty, where you could experience the deliverance of God. Do you know God? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? And if you still don't have that, if you're still not sure that you have this personal relationship with God, that can be made possible by receiving His Son, Jesus Christ, into your hearts and into your lives to be your Lord, to be your Savior. And if you want to do that today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you want. And for those of us who have already given our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, just go ahead, bow your hands. There's several things that Pastor Sonny has reminded all of us. And that is, yes, we may be facing a very difficult situation, something we prefer not to be in. But can you trust God enough to believe that if this is the will of God, I will not complain. I will not complain. And in the middle of that very adverse, perhaps unpleasant situation, can we focus our eyes on Him? And this is what you want to say today. Lord, I am committing my eyes, my heart to You. That despite what's going on in my life, 
Lord, I'd like to give my best. It may not be something I want to be a part of because it's, it's not my ideal. That's not what I'm looking for. But in this situation where you put me, I am committing to bloom. I will bloom in this. I will give my best. I will give it my best shot. And many of us probably are also challenged in the aspect of not so much in the work that we do, but in our relationship with them. How many of us are going to say, yes, I have a lot of weaknesses, but like Daniel, I could choose to have my walk upright before him. And you want to say today, I'm one of those people, Lord, I want to do that. I want to walk righteously before you. I want to walk uprightly before you. With or without people seeing me. But yes, people will see your commitment. And that leads me to the next challenge I'd like to give to you, and that is, what are we willing to give up for God? Despite the decree that Daniel knows, he knew that his life was at stake. He was willing to worship God. He was willing to give his life for the worship of his God. What are you holding on to? What is it something? What is that something in your life, if there's still anything, that we just have a hard time turning over to God? Is God worth it? And you want to say today, God, I've been holding on to this thing and it is so hard for me to just give it up. But Lord, I want to be like Daniel. That even if it would cost me my life, I'm willing to worship you. Sometimes it's very easy for us to say, Lord, I'm willing and I'm ready to die for you. Yeah, perhaps. But if we're not really ready to live for him, are we really ready to die for him? And you want to say today, Lord, Whatever it is that is that I've that been holding on to. That's why I could not make you the Lord of my life. Lord, I'm surrendering it to you. I'm surrendering it to you. So if you're any of those people, from the first one I challenged, if you want to receive Christ today as your Lord and Savior, in every area that was touched on today, and you want to make a commitment and a response to God, saying, Lord, I don't want to just hear those wonderful words and principles that you planted in our hearts today, I will act on it. I want to respond to you. I want to follow your word. Just go ahead. I want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise it high. I want you to raise it confidently, knowing that you're doing the right thing this afternoon. Go ahead and do it, okay? So I want everybody to just go ahead. Those people are raising their hands, raise it high. And those people that are standing beside someone who's raising their hand, Please go ahead and just lay your hands on them, on their shoulders. There's a lot of them. We want to minister to each other. But first, for those people who may want to receive Jesus Christ today into their lives as Lord and Savior, so that they could have this true and genuine and eternity assuring relationship with God, I want you to pray this prayer with me, along with those who have done it before, to support those who are doing it for the first time. Dear God in heaven, I thank you today for letting me hear of a story, a wonderful story, of what you can do in the life of a person who has a relationship with you. I admit that I don't have that yet because of my sins. I am separated from you, but I want that relationship. I'm asking today that you would please come into my life. Since you are the only one who sent your son to die on the cross for us, to be buried, to rise again, just to save us, 
I put my trust in you. I put my trust in Jesus Christ to be my Savior and my Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. Please come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. From now on, I will follow you. Please help me to do it. In Jesus' name. Keep on raising your hand. Heavenly Father, there are a lot of people here, dear God, who is making, or are making a very important commitment, or perhaps commitments, Lord, to you. You honor our vows. You honor our commitments. Well, in fact, you would not even want us, Lord, to make that commitment if it is not true to our hearts. But, Lord, words to you are important. You don't want to say it, but you don't want us, Lord, to say it flippantly, lackadaisically, superficially. The words we speak, Lord, you want it to come from our hearts. And as we make this commitment today, will the Lord to live a worship, of, a life of worship to you, Lord, no matter what the cost. Lord, we will do it. And some of us, dear Father, who are surrendering some things right now that we've held on for so long, the Lord, it bound us. It took control of us. That He'd become the objects of our worship. Lord, we are throwing it down at the foot of the cross this afternoon because, Lord, we want to bow our hearts and our knees and our, and our minds and everything about us, our very lives, Lord, to You. Be our God. Let us, not have, let us not have any other gods aside from you. And help us, Father God, to live, to walk, to work in a manner that we know you really are our God. And you deserve nothing, Lord, but the best. May we be the best. This word my brother has... I still remember it, Lord, before when he used to sing the highest praise. I could give to you is to give my life to you. And Lord, when we say that, we pray to God that it is not just something that we said with our lips, but that it really come from the bottom of our hearts. We want a life that's totally, totally lived out for you. And accepting whatever it is, Lord, that you put before our path. And doing the best in excellence in our work. And at the same time, Father God, in our attitude and in our character. Faultless before man. Because, Lord, we're trying to live for you. Thank you so much for everything. We need your help. But we know you're also going to help us. That's our confidence. And all of this we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name, everybody say, Amen. Amen. Amen.